Good day, everyone. Welcome to Washoe County GOP podcast. My name is Nichelle Hall, and today's guest is Ricky Rodriguez Elkins. She is running for Nevada State Assembly District 30. So on today's Meet the Candidate program, we're going to have Miss Ricky share with us a little bit about her own personal story and professional background um, before we start going into our questions. Hi, my name is Ricky Rodriguez Elkins and I'm running for Assembly District 30. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I have lived in the same home in Sparks for 31 years. Wow. So yeah, and it's we've been through a couple of updates, so it doesn't look exactly <laughs> nice. the same. Okay. But I love my neighborhood. I would say probably, you know, five of my neighbors have all we've all lived there that long. So it's it's been a community that I've really enjoyed living in. And uh, because of that, I thought that I really wanted to run for assembly district so that I could represent my community, so that I could do something about where we are as a state to make sure that we save our state and save our country. Excellent. Excellent. So I was a paramedic for 14 years and a trauma tech for two years. Uh, we moved here. We moved here uh, in um, uh, 31 years ago from the Washington, D.C. area. We lived in Maryland where I was a trauma tech and then also a uh, paramedic firefighter with Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. Um, I had been accepted to medical school there at George Washington Medical Center, and uh, my husband was suddenly being transferred over here. And um, mm -hmm. so when we were looking at this community, we saw that we had a uh, medical school here. So we thought, OK, let's move to Nevada. And our son at the time was three. And we mm -hmm. moved and fell in love with the community. We're originally from Texas. Oh, okay. and my husband being a civil engineer, we've traveled all over the United States. And we've even lived in Nigeria for a couple of years. Wow. So anyway, we moved here and fell in love with the community, all the seasons and the snow and the beautiful weather, the lakes, the hiking, all of that. And uh, so when we uh, moved here, I, as a paramedic, had been uh, certified in Texas and Maryland in a national certification, national certification instructor. Got here to apply for uh, being a paramedic because I wasn't quite ready to apply for medical school here yet and discovered that uh, they had no reciprocity. So I, I was going to have to go back and take school all over again ah. rather than just taking a test, showing my skills, and mm. going back to work after having been a paramedic for 14 years. And that's one of the things that I'm passionate about when I get to the legislature mm -hmm. because some of our professions do not have reciprocity. Yeah. And paramedics now do, some doctors do, but not all doctors and not all nurses. So that's one of the things I want to take a look at is reciprocity because it's kind of ridiculous to have experienced medical yes. professionals come in and not be able to work when we are short staffed for those medical Absolutely. professions. Absolutely. After all their so, investment of time and, and money it, exactly. and, and the skill sets, everything that the they skill need to sets do that they have and, and we have shortages in those fields. So it doesn't make any sense. No. And so that's one thing I'm passionate about. So anyway, came here and um, and uh, worked really hard to uh, take all the rest of the classes that I needed to apply to medical school. I was accepted to UNR School of Medicine. And um, we knew that my son had some issues. And uh, from the time he was two, he had a really bad stutter. He had some learning differences. And when I was in medical school, um, those differences became more apparent. And so I, um, in my second year, uh, I decided, between my second and third year, I decided that we I needed to take my son out of public school and start homeschooling him uh, because he had his whole life ahead of him. I was already an older medical student, and as much as I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a good mom and help my son 
uh, grow to his best capacity. I love that. Yeah, that was very important. And and while I was homeschooling him, I learned about these things called charter schools and uh, became very passionate about seeing what I could do to bring the charter school law here. So my husband being an engineer, we had the resources where I was able to stay at home and homeschool mm -hmm. and then also travel throughout mm -hmm. the United States to these states that had started charter schools, find out more about them, how they got started, what the curricula was like, how we could bring them here to help not only special needs kids like my son, but also kids who were high achieving, regular kids who just needed a different way of learning. Exactly. And so um, in 95 and 97, I started working with another group of moms to help bring the law here. It took us two sessions. And in fact, in 97, we really thought that, the, um, that we weren't going to get it. It was the last day. We had all of this uh, vitriol coming from the unions. Mm. Um, and we thought, OK, we're not going to get it. It was late. I went home. And then I got a call in the middle of the night from one of the other uh, um, lobbyists. Uh, we were advocates, non-paid advocates, but they're okay. paid lobbyists who okay. said uh, it passed. And we, oh, my Woo! God, it passed. That's awesome. Victory. I know. It was a big victory. Yes. I still get goosebumps yeah. thinking about that. Good job. Because we worked so hard. And uh, and at that time, I had Senator Rawson and Raggio and Townsend and others who were encouraging me to run for assembly. But we had just birthed charter schools. And uh, so I, I felt that was my mission. And um, and so worked for the next 10, 12 years, helping to start various charter schools, writing grants for them, helping them draft their charter, helping them form their boards, helping them recruit, helping them find buildings. And uh, and loved doing that. I helped Coral Academy of Science, High Desert Montessori, Sierra Nevada schools. Academy. The best Sierra schools that we Crest have. Yep. I'm very proud of Coral, especially. Yes. They've worked really hard. All of them have worked hard that are still existing. Charter schools have a lot of barriers, even today. And that's the other focus that yes. I want is not yes. just charter schools, but also I'm very interested in other alternative means for parents and their children so that they have a lot of different options and that those dollars can follow them. So it's real important to me as well. Well, that's huge. And that was a couple of questions that I had thought about for our time together today, um, which is that... You know, it, it, this is a very important time, like you were mention, mentioning before the camera started to roll, um, because we know that Washoe County School District is having some challenges and that we are seeing a number of parents leave the school district and go to the alternative forms of education that Ricky is mentioning, such as charter schools or pod schools. And I've brought this up on uh, quite a few different podcasts, um, but and I don't know the answer to this mm -hmm. question. Can you expound with us on how you might be able to, or maybe mm -hmm. not, um, try to get, would it be a parent's rights mm -hmm. bill? What what can we do to get that money right. to follow the child, our taxpayer money, following that child so the money could be used at a charter school or at one of these other alternative mm -hmm things that, that Ricky likes to work on. Yeah, absolutely. That's certainly something that I'm really looking at. I know that there's a couple of uh, other assembly persons who are looking at a parent's right bill and where, A, they have a lot more... Um, they're more empowered to be able to be more involved in their children's education. We have seen what parents have been through at school boards and that kind of thing here recently in the last couple of years, but also so that uh, money can follow the child. You know, there's it, back in the charter school days, I was not in favor of vouchers because I thought it confused parents between what a public charter school was and what a voucher was. And also at the time, vouchers were not enough to cover the tuition. So unlike a public school where the mm -hmm. tuition is fully covered because mm -hmm. the, the money followed the child to the charter school, a voucher was only a certain percentage and not all demographics could afford that difference yes. between the voucher. Got it. And and so for me, a, a voucher, I'm, I'm more in favor of vouchers now. Okay. But what I would rather see is that that full dollar follow the child, that full dollar follow the child to Absolutely. private schools, that full dollar follow ch the child to charter schools, yes. and, and to all the other options that are available in other states. Yes. Um, you had mentioned pod schools. I, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and take a look. I think it's county by county. But um, my 
recollection when I last looked was pod schools, cottage schools weren't technically allowed um, in Nevada at this point. Yeah, that's something that I would like to see. Um, I know that during COVID, what a lot of parents were doing was that because some parents were still working, not every parent can stay at home and homeschool their child unless they have the financial means to do that. Right. And children can't just, you know, be not trusted, but be expected, be expected to stay at home and stay and be studious and not fall into the habits that kids are prone to do, right? Right. And so uh, I think it's important that we that we look at these alternatives. Uh, I know some parents were wanting to pull uh, the children together, hire a teacher, yes. certified teacher, hire yes. the teacher to teach other children, but the teachers weren't really allowed to do that, so they were kind of doing it under the table. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I want that. To, to be on the table. Mm-hmm. I want that to be an option. Mm-hmm. If your child needs a classroom of 10 kids taught by one certified teacher who's fully capable, yes. there's no reason why that can't be done. They just need the financial resources to do that. Right. And I think that, I think from from doing these these programs that what I've learned is that the pod schools are going forward. There are a few that the families band together their finances and they compensate a certified teacher to run that Mm -hmm. school. And that has provided a nice opportunity for teachers who are uncomfortable with things that are going on in the County. They're, they're able to step away and still be employed Mm -hmm. in their profession. So that is happening here. But what, what, my understanding is is that we would like to find ways for this to happen on a broader scale. Yeah. So for those families that don't have the means to make up the difference to pay that certified teacher, we'd like to find scholarship opportunities, corporate mm-hmm. partnerships. We'd like to see that go forward so that this can be broadened out. So I'm just sharing yeah. that for whatever it's worth. Yeah, no, and I think <laughs> that, when you get elected, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when, tomorrow, when, tomorrow, exactly. <laughs> Go out and vote. <laughs> yes, that's right. I tell you, we're trying to make sure that all the. Let's talk about that for a second, let's if do that's it. okay. Of because course. I get numbers every day from uh, various uh, 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 PACs and and uh, other resources who send me the analytics. And right now, statewide, well, northern Nevada wide, um, we are very low numbers for Republicans and independents who are, who are out to vote, who have already voted. Okay. Um, we've got about 46% of the Democrats who have mm. voted, mm. 30% of the Republicans who have voted, and mm. 26% of the independents. Mm. Now, typically, Republicans and independents wait for Election Day. True. We wait for Election Day. We That rite of passage, yes. waiting in line, talking tradition. to other people is tradition, yeah. right? And but we we may have a snowstorm tomorrow. We might a big snowstorm with with heavy winds, mm-hmm. and so we're really encouraging you know especially our more frail citizens, yes, uh, you know our older citizens that that if if standing in line for possibly an hour mm-hmm. you know in the cold and snow is yeah. is not for you. Go ahead and either put your ballot in a mailing box or call, you know, the local GOP office. I know several of us have volunteered to mm-hmm. go and pick up ballots because mm-hmm. we can do that legally now. Yes, we can. Um, and it's very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if you're in that boat, you know, you could ask a neighbor to drop yep. your, your ballot off at the closest polling center. But exactly. certainly... Um, the Washoe GOP office on South Virginia and Moana, we, we're collecting ballots and we will bring those in. Um, we're committed to be here, yeah. snow or rain or shine, whatever. Exactly. We'll be here all day doing that. So yeah, very important. Yeah, for sure. We do, you know, the timing of this, the day before the election, um, we do want to encourage all those independents and Republicans, everybody should be, should be voting. It's mm-hmm. so important this year. So for yeah. sure. Good message there. Um, now, if we can go back a little bit, I, I saw on your campaign website that you've been involved with the community in different ways for, you mm-hmm. know, a number of years and in different organizations. And I was wondering if you could share with us what your specific role in the Rotary mm-hmm. was and, and, and what what you got to accomplish sure. or work on in the sure, Rotary. Sure, sure. Well, the Rotary is a civic organization, and we have a lot of different projects. I've been with the Rotary now for about two years, 
And um, um, I don't hold an office in, in that particular club. I do with the Optimist Club and not with Rotary. Uh, but certainly I'm, uh, you know, a loyal member. And uh, various projects that we've done with the Rotary, we've adopted Pinecrest Charter School mm -hmm. as one of our uh, uh, groups that we work with. We've raised money and resources to not only buy but to install uh, benches, friendship benches at the school, as well as books. We uh, have book, books that we provide every month, essentially. Wonderful. We have our speakers, when they come in, sign a book as well, so that that book uh, has um, uh, some special meaning, yes. right, exactly, that whenever we deliver it to the school. Another one of the organizations that we support is Trees Are Us. Um, and, and actually, th I introduced them to the Rotary, their uh, Optimist Club members, okay. and I was so impressed with what this young man is doing. He's only, I think he's 12, he may be 13 now, uh, Diego, but he has a nonprofit that he and his dad operate where they go and they uh, buy seedlings and they plant trees all over the community. Wonderful. And I'm talking about hundreds of trees. Wow. I and mean, they have really, really, really done a great mm -hmm. job with this endeavor. Fantastic. And we're really proud of them. So Rotary was real impressed with them and it provided a donation to them as well as that's the other thing that Rotary does is that we plant trees as well. So it was kind of a match made in I heaven, you know. Once that. I, yeah, once yeah. I saw, once I saw uh, what Diego and his dad were doing, you know, I went to Rotary and said, "Hey, they they match us exactly because we've planted trees all along Para Park, Shadow Mountain, you know, different parks." That's wonderful. And uh, so I we have a lot of different things that we do at Rotary. I have a personal connection to Rotary. Um, in the past, when I worked at the Boys and Girls Club, they renovated some of our sites in yep. the North Valleys. Yes. I mean, they would come out with 20 people and yep. do the work and um, clean up beautifully afterwards. And they have been such a blessing to that yeah. organization over the years. So yeah, yep. they and we've also done work for the Eddie House. So that those are we do various projects throughout the year. And we, we make a, a bulk of the money that we use to support these different projects through our golf tournament. Every year we have a go. That is one of the positions that I've held for several years is I, I am a coach with the golf tournament and uh -huh. so uh, we you know have made you know upwards of twenty thousand dollars on those one year during COVID in fact what we did was we gave grants out so we took uh, that twenty ish thousand dollars and then kept ten for our rotary expenses and the other ten we granted out a thousand at a time and uh, so we had uh, ten different organizations that not organizations individual businesses okay and that we helped to support uh, during COVID so that they had an extra thousand dollars to pay any, you know, whatever they payroll, if yes. they couldn't make payroll or buy cleaning supplies, you yes. know, whatever they needed to do during yes. COVID. That's excellent. That's mm -hmm. excellent. And, you know, speaking of COVID, um, I noticed in your recent radio spot that, um, you know, you were a proponent of, um, you know, keeping the economy going that you, you know, in your radio spot, it was like you were commenting that during COVID-19, those business shutdowns yeah. ended up being very harmful for Nevada, right. you know, and you made that point. And so, um, you know, when these things happen, these events, um, sometimes our our governments tell us that, you know, in the name of safety, public safety, mm -hmm. uh, maintaining public order that they need to curtail maybe some of our freedoms or, or liberties in order to keep us safe or keep society going. And so my question is, um, do you ever think about, you know, in the future, if some other event, if some other destabilizing situation mm -hmm. occurs and Nevada wants to do something similar to what happened in, in the COVID-19 yeah. situation and our businesses shut down. Um, what, what kinds of things in the assembly can right. be proposed right. to, right. to help us hang on to our liberties? Right. Well, I think it's important to recognize we are still in a state of emergency. A lot of people do not realize that the governor has not released us from the state of emergency. And you only really notice it when you go into the hospitals because a lot of the hospitals yes. still have the mask requirements in certain areas, whereas in other areas you don't have to wear the mask, but you step one foot that direction, you have to wear a mask 
I don't yes. understand that, but yes. uh, but we are still in a state of emergency. Yeah, I, I think that it is important for a governor of any flavor to be able to have some limited authority in in a state of emergency to mm-hmm. um, to protect the citizens, mm-hmm. but not for months and years. Years, right? <laughs> in this case, right. years, but even for months. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, maybe a, a two to three week period where there's a state of emergency until you can bring all the legislators back. Mm -hmm. And then once the legislators are back, then they are able to um, assess the situation, see where we are, what was the issue, uh, what still needs to be done. And then the legislators are the ones who take authority over that state of emergency. Right. I mean, that seems a lot more democratic in in terms of one person making that decision as opposed to this legislative body representing we the people. And we know we were told originally it was going to be two weeks, two weeks right? <laughs> and then um, and then it yeah. really got away from us. So I think that sounds like a great example of mm-hmm. Ricky's common sense solutions, mm-hmm. which she, she talks about on her website, that, you know, it's reasonable to take a couple of weeks to get all the brains together and brainstorm and figure out, you know, what we need to do. But um, that that is common sense, not... Closing and shuttering the businesses right. down for, exactly. for so long. And, and only the small businesses. I mean, the right. Walmarts, the Targets, they're all still open, the huge corporations. But the small businesses are who suffered. And I'm a commercial realtor. You know, I'm, I didn't explain that piece of it, mm-hmm. but one of the things that I did for charter schools was help find their buildings. And, and I loved helping. I loved that. I loved helping to start new schools. And that kind of merged into helping new businesses start. And uh, so I became a commercial realtor. And I've been a commercial realtor now for 15 years. And I absolutely love it. I love bringing new industry in. I love helping people fulfill their visions for their own businesses. And I had several brand new small businesses that had opened right before COVID. One of them, a little baloteria, a little ice cream, Mexican ice cream shop right across from Reed, and literally signed their lease a week before the, the shutdown. And I was so worried for them. They survived. You know, Engineer Ben Winery survived. Yeah. Sparks Water Bar survived. But it was hard. It was really, really hard. And uh, my heart bled for them mm-hmm. every day trying mm-hmm. to make sure mm-hmm. that they were going to survive. Right. And right. so, you know, making sure that small businesses is not forgotten about the mom and pops are who you know have a majority of the businesses mm-hmm. uh, and the least amount of resources and so that's part of what I want to make sure of as well I love that um, is there anything else as we kind of wrap up our time together today that you would like us to know about what you want to hope to accomplish as assemblywoman sure no I, I appreciate the opportunity I really do um, I think one of the things, I, I've probably walked over 3,000 doors myself. And what I'm hearing day in and day out is everybody is concerned about the economy. They're worried about the state of education. Um, they're concerned about where we are as a state and as a country. And they're tired of big government. They're tired of mm-hmm. politicians who stay in place for decades. Mm-hmm. And it's so important that we have real people sitting at our state houses because in order to save our government, our our country, we have to do it state by state. Mm -hmm. And we need your vote. We need you to get out today. If you haven't already been out to vote, we need you to get out and get your mail-in ballot in. You can hand deliver it or you can stick it in the mail. Go to everybody that you know. We need to have an enormous number of Republicans and independents not sit at home this year. Yes. We had, um, Alexis Hansen was telling me yesterday that we had, I think it was 27,000 um, in, in Washoe County, 27,000 Republicans that did not vote in the last election. And that is the difference right there between winning and losing. For sure. We need to consider voting our duty because we've had our our volunteer military and, you know, give up so much to to safeguard and guarantee our ability to vote. And so many countries don't have the privilege of voting. And so we, the people, need to be active every single 
every single election yeah. cycle. And to show you how important it is, because I've heard some people say, well, I'm just one vote. I'm just one vote. But Jill Dickman, who's yes. Assemblywoman 31, mm -hmm. or District 31, uh, she said one year she won by 10 votes. 10 votes. Every vote Every counts. vote counts, for sure. And, you know, this message that Ricky is bringing forth to us about the um, the term limits, these long mm -hmm. tenures that, that these people come into office, they start out hopefully with just, you know, serving the people, but then it becomes this lifelong career. Yeah. That doesn't seem to work because we're getting this entrenched leadership in that is becoming an encroachment mm -hmm. upon people's liberties, which is what Ricky is saying that, you know, it's the real people that need to step in and yes. just serve for a time and then come back e out exactly. and go back to their small exactly. business or, or whatever. Exactly. Their and I think be. that's the big difference between real people and the current politicians is that real people have had businesses. They've raised their families. They've had businesses. They've been involved in their communities. And a lot of the people who are in office, especially at the federal level, have never owned businesses. They've never signed a paycheck. They don't know, understand what it's like. And so they're spending our money yes. frivolously mm -hmm. in uh -huh. setting unreasonable laws. And not affording the everyday Americans who work so hard and pay the taxes um, the the breaks that they need, not not seeing them as, you know, we the politicians are here to empower and serve and safeguard you and and help promote prosperity. It yeah. becomes we are being served by you. We are using your taxpayer money for things that maybe you want, maybe you don't want. But you know, there can be that dynamic that tends to shift. I mean, that seems like what a lot of Americans are. Noticing this midterm as we see the independence and African-American males and the Latino mm -hmm. population start shifting to yeah. the right this midterm. So it is a message that seems to be prominent. Absolutely. Well, we are so grateful for Ricky's time today. And I, I hope you all um, got a better chance at understanding where she's coming from and why she's running for Assemblywoman District 30. Please go out and vote on Election Day tomorrow, November 8th. And we just thank you so much for coming thank on the you. show. I appreciate it. Thank very you, much. Ricky. Thank you.